All right. I forgot to mention during the announcements that Easter is coming up here real soon. So uh, it's two or three weeks away, and we want you to invite somebody to come and be here. We have a baby dedication that will take place that morning. We have a baptism uh, service that will take place that night. All the information will get to you as we get a little closer, but it's going to be a special day for us. I want you to turn to the Old Testament book of Esther. Esther. It is between Nehemiah and Job. And Job, as you remember last week, Job was just to the left there of Psalms. So if you go to Psalms, you turn left, you're going to get here to Esther pretty soon. This is a very, very interesting story, and I'm so glad that God chose to include this in his word. This is, this is an amazing story. It's a delightful story, and uh, it's going to be one that I think is going to encourage us a great deal If the story of Esther is anything, it's about moral courage, the ability to stand up when the temptation is to remain silent, the ability to listen to the right voice, and that is the voice of God when there are voices calling for us to do other things. I'm not talking about being schizophrenic. I'm talking about voices and messages that are out there in the world that are pressing in upon us, voices of compromise, voices of intimidation, voices that make us feel that doing right is wrong when indeed doing right is always the right thing to do. But there are times in our lives, based upon the circumstances and based upon the context, when doing right feels wrong. And Esther was living in one of those situations. Let me give you a little bit of background here in case you're not familiar with the story of Esther. Her experience occurred around 480 B.C. and it was in the middle of the Persian Empire. And so she was a Jew and she was exiled, as many Jews were, to Persia. And she was in the capital city called Susa. And her experience was about 10 years long. That's what this book records, is about 10 years of her life. Her Jewish name was Hadassah, but she was called Esther because that was her Persian name. It comes from the Persian word Ishtar, which means star. Maybe you've heard that before. She had a cousin who had raised her since she was little. And the Bible tells us that she had no parents, that somehow her parents had had died and passed along. And so her cousin, older cousin Mordecai, raised her and taught her the ways of the Jewish faith. And raised her to do the right thing, even in the face of this exile that they were experiencing. Now, at the time of Esther, many Jews had already returned to the Promised Land, as they were allowed to do during the Persian Empire. And so Esther is stuck in between the first return during the days of the priest Ezra and the second return that we're more familiar with, which was during the days of Nehemiah. We did a whole message series on Nehemiah. And so these Jews were returning back to the promised land, but Esther and Mordecai did not. For some reason, they chose not to. And as I learned this week, many Jews decided not to return to the promised land because they were living pretty comfortable lives, even in the midst of exile. And that was the case with Esther and Mordecai. And so here we have an individual, again, who we've seen throughout this whole message series is not a perfect individual, does not always bat a thousand with respect to her faith, just like you and me, right? But eventually, when push came to shove, Esther followed through and did the right thing. And so it's pretty exciting to think about it. Let's read in chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. This will give us a little bit of the context before we proceed forward. Chapter 1, verse 1. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. Now, if you have a different translation of the Bible, you may have the Hebrew word there, Ahasuerus, which was the Hebrew word for three rulers of Persia. And so the NIV version of the Bible just goes ahead and tells us it's Xerxes because that's who it's talking about. So during the time of Xerxes, that is the Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Cush. Now, the writer here is giving us an idea of the vast expanse of this empire. This was a powerful, powerful king. In fact, if you've seen the movie 300, you're a little bit familiar with the power 
of the armies and, and, and the fortresses and the, the power of this uh, empire. It was vast, it was amazing, and it was huge. And so it talks about the provinces stretching from India. So if you head east, India at that point in time would have been western Pakistan. And if you go from there all the way to the west, to Kush, is the upper Nile region of Egypt. Basically, it was the entire Middle East. You think about all the Middle East, the entire Middle East, plus some of Egypt. This was a huge empire. Verse 2. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. This was the capital city. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials, the military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. Now you can read through that and not understand the historical significance of even that passage, even those couple of verses there. Historians believe that when the book of Esther is describing this time, this is the time when uh, Xerxes was planning for months in advance his invasion of Greece. And again, if you've seen the movie 300, this was in response to his father's defeat at a place called Marathon when they invaded the Greeks there, but the Greeks pushed them back. And then uh, Xerxes now was planning another attack, and he was to face the Greeks and the allies of the Greeks there at the Pass of Thermopylae. That's where that whole movie occurs. And there the Greeks stood them back for three days. So eventually Persia won that particular battle, but Persia lost the war against the Greeks. So this is a real defining moment in history, and Esther was right here in the middle of it. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Esther. As was a custom of that day, the kings had a harem, many women that they would call their own, basically, that were their own property. One of them would rise to the top and be made queen. And sure enough, at this time, King Xerxes had a queen, and her name was Vashti. Well, Vashti disobeyed King Xerxes. He called for her one day, and she refused to come. And we don't know why, but she refused to come. And so he cast her out because, of course, she was supposed to come to the royal court when he called for her. He cast her out, and they had basically a beauty contest. And they march all these women before the king, and the king says, yeah, I like that one, I don't like that one, yeah, I like that one, this beauty contest. And guess what? Esther was named Miss Persia. <laughs> she was the most beautiful of them all. Here, this Jewish girl, by the way, the king did not know that she was Jewish. In fact, her cousin Mordecai instructed her to keep that a secret. Now, all this is going to become unveiled later on. But at this point in time, Xerxes did not know that Esther was a Jew. He chooses Esther. She becomes Miss Persia, and she is made the new queen, and she is given all kinds of gifts and all kinds of privileges and all kinds of perks. Well, the story goes on, and there is a plot that is established by some of the other nobles to kill King Xerxes, and her cousin Mordecai finds out about this plot. Mordecai tells Esther, Esther tells the king, they verify the story, and sure enough, Mordecai is celebrated as a hero because he saves the king's life. And Esther is also congratulated and granted favor in the eyes of the king. Fast forward a little bit more. Because of what Mordecai did, one of the other royal officials, one of the other wealthy men, hated Mordecai. In fact, Mordecai, the Bible tells us here in this book, refused to bow at this man Haman's feet. And Haman believed he deserved people to bow to him when he passed by. And so Mordecai would not, and it caused Haman to hate Mordecai, and in fact, it caused Haman to hate all the Jews. And so he comes up with this plot to exterminate all the Jews that are there as a part of the Persian kingdom. Mordecai finds out about it, and he is deeply troubled, we read, because he feels like it's his fault, basically, because he didn't bow at the feet of Haman. It is his fault that Haman is now going to try to kill all the Jews. So he repents. He's in sackcloth and ashes. He's mortified by what's going to take place. He tells Esther to go to King Xerxes and beg for the people of Israel, to beg for the Jews. 
for their salvation. And so, this is where the critical moment comes. So all this has led up to this point where Esther now must decide what she's going to do. Is she going to risk her own life? Is she going to risk her privileges? Is she going to risk her wealth to do the right thing? And in this context, there are many voices that are calling out to her, telling her not to do that. In this context, doing right really feels wrong. But let's talk about the voices that are calling out to her, the voices of compromise. I want to share with you three of those voices, the way that her faith gets expressed to do the right thing. First of all, the voice of self-preservation. The key word here is survival. <clears throat> survival. Look in chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. <clears throat> Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, now there's a messenger going between Mordecai and Esther because Mordecai cannot enter into the king's palace and talk directly. So there's this messenger called Hatak, and he is running messages between Mordecai and Esther. So Mordecai says to the messenger, tell Esther to tell the king and to beg for the people of Israel before the king. And this is what she says, verse 10, then she instructed him, that is Hatak, to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law that he be put to death. You don't just go and knock on the door and say, I'd like to see the king, please. You had to be summoned before the king. And if you dared approach the king without being summoned or called, if the king showed favor towards you coming, he would allow you to touch the golden scepter. That meant you were okay to proceed forward. But here was this moment in her life where she had to choose, am I going to go before the king? Because going before the king, and this is literal, folks, going before the king meant the possibility of death for Esther. She had a decision to make. And so survival instincts kick in, right? Right? The whole idea of self-preservation, we all have survival instincts. We all react and respond when things get dicey, when life gets tough, and when doing the right thing involves a price that we must pay. I want to show you a video clip. This is a way of illustrating this from the movie Cinderella Man. It stars Russell Crowe. Maybe you've seen it. If you haven't seen this movie, it is an excellent movie. You need to rent it. You need to watch it. But a video clip of the interaction that he has with his son who had just done something ineth unethical. And they're in the time of the Depression. And as you know, it was a very desperate, desperate time. Uh, and uh, this is a very interesting clip that illustrates moral courage. What are you doing, son? I'm being good. I'm being quiet. I'm being hate. Great. <laughs> Daddy! Daddy! Hey, Rosie Cheek! How you doing? Daddy! Jay Star! What? Jay Star. What's all this about? See? It's a salon. Young lady. Your brother's in enough trouble without you telling on him. You understand? It's from the butchers. And he won't say a word about it, will you, Jay? Will you, Jay? Okay, pick it up. Let's go. Do not test me, boy. Right now. Howard, stay here.
Marty Johnson had to go away to Delaware to live with his uncle. Why? His parents didn't have enough money for them to eat. Yeah, well, things ain't easy at the moment, Jay. You're right. There's a lot of people worse off than what we are. And just because things ain't easy, that don't give you the excuse to take what's not yours, does it? That's stealing, right? We don't steal. No matter what happens, we don't steal. Not ever. You got me? Are you giving me your word? Yes. Go on. I promise. And I promise you, we will never send you away. <laughs> it's okay, kid. You got a little scared, I understand. get a little scared we tend to compromise our integrity this is what was going on with Esther so doing right feels wrong when there's a personal price to pay sure it does in fact let me give you kind of the, the, the three aspects of when we are most likely to compromise. When these three things come together in our lives, then it is a moment of, of a crisis for us and a choice that we have to make with respect to our morality. The first thing is incentive. When incentive is a part of our life, there's a context that is kind of pushing us in a certain direction. The second thing is rationalization. When we can rationalize and justify in our minds doing the wrong thing, that's when we'll do the wrong thing. And then third is opportunity. When we have incentive, when we have rationalization, when we have opportunity, then we are pushed and we are a part of a current that's pushing us to go the wrong direction and to do the wrong thing. But here's the problem. Here's the issue. With Esther, the issue, the survival was, was a matter of death. It was death for her. For you and me, the stakes are not ever that high. And so most of the time, our compromise and our lack of moral courage has to do around issues of comfort and convenience. It might cost us a job in the short term. And our belief is, well, this is too high a price to pay. But what price are you willing to pay in order to lose your integrity. So the voice of self-preservation can make us feel that doing the right thing is wrong. But I want to remind you, and I want to remind myself, that doing the right thing almost always costs something. Often, when I'm taking the kids to school, we will pray, every morning we will pray, but often we will pray, Lord, help us to do the right thing today, no matter how hard it is to do. You see, there's a world outside these walls with voices and messages that are pressing in upon us, some of which are very intimidating, that say, it's okay. It's okay to do the wrong thing. Which leads to the second thing I want to say to you. The second voice and that is the voice of apathy. The voice of apathy. Look in verse 11 of chapter 4. The end of verse 11 says, the, on, the only exception to this is for the king to extend the gold scepter to him and spare his life. And then she says this, But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, again, remember, you didn't go to the king unless you were called and summoned. And so these women would not go to the king unless the king would call them. And he had several women in the harem. And so the king had not called for Esther for a period of 30 days. And she's like, listen, it's been a while. He may not even like me anymore. He may not even want me anymore. It's been 30 days. And so here's the path that she was walking. Here's the context 
the context was, well, it's easier to do nothing at all. And doing right feels wrong when it's easier to do nothing at all. In fact, to do the right thing, you have to kind of interject. You have to intercede. You have to disrupt things. You have to upset the apple cart. You have to shake up the status quo. There's this path. There's this context. There's this way of doing life. It's pretty convenient. It's pretty comfortable. Things are not going bad. In fact, things are going pretty good. And so the voice of apathy is screaming, don't do anything. Just sit down and be quiet. (laughs) And that's when it feels wrong to do right. Churchill said this, Winston Churchill said, all it takes for evil people to triumph is for good people to do nothing. You see, we don't have to be bad people in order for evil to triumph. We just have to be good people who don't do good things. We just have to be people who by omission don't act. Who by omission don't have courage. Who by omission compromise. No, we wouldn't say something and we wouldn't do something. But in not saying something and in not doing something, we are actually people who lack integrity and moral courage. And this was what was going on with Esther. And everything called for her to just be quiet and stay put. She had seven maids that were assigned to her. She had a place in the palace. She was number one. She was the queen. She was not a have-not kind of person. She had it all. And she was about to risk it. Now, I was interested in this. Why is it, why is it that in our lives we kind of shackle our, our moral courage and I was, I was kind of researching this week, and I found an article, and it was pretty interesting because it gave a kind of a real-life example of what happens with many of us today. And it was a psychology article, but I want to share this with you because it's pretty interesting because I think it illustrates often kind of what we feel in these moments of decision. The article says this, For more than, more than 40 years, Peggy Cahara has felt guilty about Stuart. Peggy likes Stuart. They went to high school together. Their fathers were friends, both farmers, in central uh, California's valley. And Peggy would always say hi when she passed Stuart in the hall. Yet every day when Stuart boarded their school bus, a couple of boys would tease him mercilessly. And every day, Peggy would just sit in her seat, silent. I was dying inside for him, she said. There were enough of us on the bus who were feeling awful. We could have done something, but none of us said anything. Peggy still can't explain why she didn't stick up for Stuart. She had known his tormentors since they were all little kids. She didn't find them threatening. She thinks if she had spoken up on his behalf, the other kids might have chimed in to make the teasing stop. But perhaps most surprising and most distressing to Peggy is that she considers herself an assertive and moral person. Yet those convictions aren't backed up by her conduct on the bus. See, folks, there can be a real disconnect between what we think and believe about ourselves and what we are willing to do. And moral courage must be expressed in our actions, even when the voices of apathy are calling out, even when the voices of indifferences are calling out, even when the voices of compromise are calling out. Doing the right thing is always the right thing to do. The third voice is the voice of approval. And how prominent this is in our world today, the need to be liked, the need to be approved, the need for people to uh, applaud us and to be pleased with us. Look in chapter 2. We'll turn back a couple of chapters. In verse 17 and 18, this is the whole story of when Esther was made queen. In verse 17, it says this, Now the king loved Esther more than all the women. So there was something more going on there. It wasn't just about him lying with her. It wasn't just about her beauty. She found favor in his eyes. And she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, 
he called it. For all his nobles and officials, he proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. So here's Esther basking in the glow of the king's favor. Everything's going great for her. She is queen. She has power. She has wealth. She has approval. And doing right feels wrong when you want to be liked by others. And you, when you risk the disapproval of others by doing the right thing. Some of us are approval addicts. We make decisions based upon other people. And ultimately, there's only one approval that you need. That is the approval of God. His approval is really the only approval that matters in this world. And so ultimately, we have to decide in our lives, which audience are we going to live for? Who are we going to live for? Is it going to be for others or is it going to be for God? And so we march to the beat of his drum. We live for an audience of one. We live to walk in the approval of God. And yet the need for approval drives many of our actions. The need for approval drives many of our omissions. God's approval is ultimately all that we need. And then ultimately, turn to chapter 4, verse 16. Let's consider the voice that she actually listened to. With all these voices, the voices of self-preservation, the, the voices of apathy, the voices of approval, and yet who ultimately did she listen to? Verse 16, chapter 4. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And here's that famous phrase. Maybe you've heard it before. It's found right here in the Bible. Esther says this, and if I perish, I perish. Wow. Well, I kind of like to do the right thing and then let God kind of save me. <laughs> right? In Scripture, every once in a while, we see these moments of obedience, these moments of courage in people of the Bible where they say, if I die, I die. <laughs> There's something worse than death. Now, we have a really hard time understanding that. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Remember those guys in Daniel who said they would not bow at the king's feet? The king came to them and said, if you don't bow, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. And they said, well, king, that's your decision. All we know is that we cannot bow to you. And then they said this. They said, O oh, king, if you choose to throw us into the furnace, the God we serve is able to rescue us from it. And then they said this. But even if he does not, we will not bow. It's the even if I die kind of obedience. It's the even if it cost me kind of thing. Even if God doesn't rescue me. If I perish, I perish. But come hell or high water, I'm going with God. I'm doing the right thing. If I lose my job, I lose my job. That's not my control. What I have control of is my moral fortitude, my moral choices. If I lose this friendship, I lose this friendship. If I lose this person's approval, I lose this person's approval. I'm going God's way. And so Esther stands as an example of a woman, again, who didn't have it all right, but who eventually did the right thing, even when it felt really, really wrong. And one of the tragedies of World War II was the silence of so many people during the rise of Hitler's reign. Just the utter silence and the intimidation. People like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, though, who was a Christian pastor, who escaped Germany, came to the United States, 
had a moment with God and said, I must go back. Hitler threw him into prison and executed him about three days before Hitler actually committed suicide. Here's a Christian pastor who stood up against Hitler in the midst of Germany. You had other Christians, Christians like Corey Ten Boom, her family, who were in Holland, who chose to hide Jews in their basement. Eventually, her family was arrested, put into a concentration camp. She was the only sibling that survived the concentration camp, doing the right thing. Folks, in this world of shades of gray, in this, in this world of consumerism, in this, this world of confusing messages, moral courage calls for clarity on our part. We will say, we're going to do the right thing even when it feels wrong. And I'm here to say to you that a Christian who does that will stand in stark contrast to a world of shades of gray. And will shine a beacon of light in a world, not in an arrogant way, not in an obnoxious way, but in a humble, God-serving kind of way. will say, I'm going the right way, I'm doing the right thing. No matter what it costs. I pray that I'll be that kind of Christian. And I'll pray that you will too. Let's stand. Let's close in prayer. With our heads bowed. I want to remind you that this week, the voices of apathy, of self-preservation, the voices of approval will cry out. The messages are loud. They are intense. They are intimidating. But will you be the kind of believer who has the moral courage to do the right thing even when it feels wrong? Father, we pray for the strength to see these moments of decision, for the eyes to be aware of when they come our way. We pray, God, for the inner fortitude and, fortitude and courage to be the people that you've called us to be. Esther, in the middle of this pagan world, chose to do the right thing. And Father, you blessed her. And she survived, and the nation of Israel survived. Your hand of providence was evident. And Lord, help us to follow you, even at the risk of high cost. Help us, Father, to be light that shines in darkness and to give you all the glory and honor for it. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.